Hey guys, welcome back to the Misfit Independent Podcast. So excited to have you back here. I know I took a little bit of a hiatus, but sometimes it's difficult to be a content creator and uh, I spent some time traveling. You guys may know that. I spent some time in Florida. Um, Vahid, our new guest, was actually there with me for a little bit and uh, I'm really excited to have Vahid on because we've been friends for a very long time and Vahid and I have a funny story. <laughs> We actually met in the elevator of uh, my old condo building. Um, Vahid was in the elevator. He was my neighbor, like literally lived across the hall for me. So that was a lot of fun. It was like living in adult residence. Um, but he comes into the elevator. It's negative 18 degrees. He's wearing shorts and headphones. And I was just really excited that there was another young person on my floor. So I started chatting Vahid up, gave him an elevator pitch, and now we're best friends. That's right. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, that's that's the Coles note of story how we met. Yeah, there's definitely more into it, but yeah, it's about that. Yeah, went to the gym and then I saw you at the gym. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, me and my boyfriend live across the hall, and then. Yeah, I wasn't hitting on him. I was just no, excited. No, 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 no. <laughs> but no, it was just and then I met Alex and I got Alex's number, and then I messaged you guys on a Wednesday. I was like, hey, do you guys want to have dinner or something? <laughs> like, and you guys are like, oh yeah, sure, let's do it. And yeah, that's how we met. You never know who you got to meet, so you got to be open. You always got to be open. You always got to be nice to everybody. Uh, I gave the audience a little TLDR, but you went full in to the story, which is all good. All good, Vahid. But today, the reason why we're chatting and what this episode is about is on how to break into tech, what the tech industry is, and how people are making massive salaries working in tech. So just give you guys a little background, like kind of how I got here. Uh, so I, I went to Laurier actually for university. I did a double degree there. I did a uh, business corporate finance, which was like the BBA. And I also did financial mathematics at the same time. Uh, so the nice part of the program was we had co-ops. So I got to actually go work in real companies every other semester and then come back. And uh, I did all my finance co-ops and I realized one after each other, I hated finance. And I was like, damn, what am I doing here? Five years later, two degrees. I don't like what I did. So like most people, I fell into sales kind of by kind of randomly because they don't really teach you in the school that sales is a path that you can take. Mm -hmm. Usually in school, the sales of people are doing sales are the, I'm a car salesman or just like they have a really negative connotation. Yeah, sales is definitely kind of frowned upon, and it's it's I'm so unfortunate, but I definitely agree with you. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those things that you don't really think about it as a career choice. So, uh, so when I got out, I was out of school for about a couple of months, and then I was like, it was like a BDR role that came along. And in tech, I mean, for your audience, if they don't know, uh, one of the first jobs that if you want to crack into tech sales, a BDR role or a business development rep, it's also called SDR, which is sales development rep and got into that so uh at the company called hootsuite and uh, started there um just it, it's, it's it's a pretty shitty job okay like it's not a it's definitely not a fun job when you start so you're cold calling people you're kind of trying to figure out how to book a meeting get somebody's attention especially if you're trying to get executives to come do this it's really difficult but you learn ton of stuff i mean it's it's necessary for everybody who is trying to get into tech sales to go through it at least for one year. It, it helps you initiate conversations. It helps you articulate your thoughts better to executive leadership. If you really want to get into something like this, this is like an absolute no brainer. Okay. So can we just backtrack? So you mentioned when you first got into sales, you're working at Hootsuite yeah. and you started as a BDR. What's a BDR? So a BDR is a business development rep. Basically what you do is you book meetings for account executives to actually close uh, the deals for you, right? You're not really closing deals. You're literally just booking meetings. So you're kind of like prospecting. You're prospecting, uh, you're booking meetings for AEs, and then you do a bit of a qualification, just a little bit on the phone. Then when you set the meetings, when the, your, AE show, your account executive shows up, they're not blindsided. They know like who these guys are, and they're actually have a sort of, you qualify their interest. Let's say. Okay. Right. So... Within sales, there's different levels. You talked a little bit about account executives. Is it, you mentioned most people start as a BDR. Yeah. 
is there any other levels within that hierarchy that if somebody's looking to break through in tech and they're applying to jobs, what would they be applying for? So if it's tech, uh, it's pretty much a BDR and SDR type of role where you start. It's really SaaS. Uh, advertising and stuff like that is different. Like I'm, we're just talking about SaaS okay. and software. And not the kind of SaaS that I have, right? Uh, no, not the kind of SaaS <laughs> that you have. No, uh, it's definitely not that. But SaaS is software as a service, right? So any software company almost, it actually, it's funny enough, the company that initiated this whole structure was Salesforce back in early 2000s late nineties. So they are the ones who actually started the whole idea of having a BDR sales used to be that account executive, a salesperson would do the whole thing. They would book the meeting, they would prospect, they do the closing and they would take care of the client. So obviously like you don't get to close so many when you have to do so many other things. Right? So they realize, okay, why don't we just make a team of people who just book meetings, make a team of people who are just closing it make a team of people who are going to take care of them after it goes, gets closed, right? And they split it in separate, three separate, like, kind of areas. It's kind of like with uh, Henry Ford when he was starting the, the automation of making cars. He saw a lot of um, optimization when he had people take on different parts and the whole system worked a lot better. So I guess exactly. that's why they moved to that structure. I mean, just it's obvious, like once you get into a cadence of doing the same thing over and over, you just get better at it yeah. rather than doing three things. Right. I don't know if you ever uh, folded your clothing after you have a big like laundry. Yeah. I usually just start with like either my underwear first and then I do my T-shirts. And then I, so you get a lot faster than that rather than if you're going to do it one by one because your mind is, just doesn't work that way. Human mind is more it's better when it's focused on one task that are similar and it's repetitive. That's why it works really well. BDR, it's a repetitive job. It's disheartening because you get a lot of no's, uh, a lot of to kind of like kind of screw off sort of in the conversations you're going to have with a lot of people who don't want to be reached out to. Uh, but it teaches you a lot of valuable lessons. I mean, you learn how to break into accounts. You learn how to break into uh speaking to executives or speaking to people who are making the actual actual business decisions you know what i always find it funny is that a lot of people you talk to in sales like some some of them have authorities to sign off on some sizable deals and sizable contracts that's way over their own their annual salary which is kind of crazy like if you're making like 80 grand 90 grand and you're allowed to sign up to three hundred thousand dollars on a software deal just think about how would that make you feel so it's really important for you to really understand who is on the other side. It's, 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 I always think that when it says B2B sales, it's never B2B ever. You're always selling to another human on the other line. So you really want to make sure that you're playing the person. You're selling to the person. You're not selling to the company. You really have to figure out it, it's what is that this makes this person tick rather than anything else. Right. I think a lot of people do things uh, internally, as in that what, what drives you internally. You got to figure out what drives them internally and what would it, what would it make sense for them to go through with the deal or just like pick you out of your competitors. So I think you really have to have a good understanding. It really teaches you this job, the BDR role to really understand people. Right. Yeah. And that's invaluable, really. Sales is definitely all about understanding people and psychology yeah. and what makes people tick, like you said. Absolutely. But if somebody wanted to explore a career in sales, we talked a little bit about how sales used to be very taboo. Yeah. And a lot of universities, like back when I was in school, we didn't have sales as a designation or a specialization or a major that you could take, right? So if you wanted to break into sales right now, if you wanted to earn some of these incredibly high salaries that people earn, and we'll talk a little bit about what the salary potential is for people. But I'm curious, if I'm a university student right now, or if I wanted to make a career change, how do I break into tech? Uh, so you need to go through a BDR and SDR route. You have to, you have to start from there. It's really, really difficult to, especially if you're trying to, let's say you've been an engineer, I have, I know even had friends who are accountants and I had somebody who was a management consultant, like a full on, like he worked at PwC, he worked as a management consultant for one year 
and it's a really good gig. Like, yeah, I mean, it's a it's tough t- job to get. It's, it's like really, it's really he hated it. So he started as an SDR at a at a software company in Toronto, and then he is now like an enterprise account executive. But yeah, like you have to start as an SDR, and the way to get those type of jobs. STR, uh, sales development rev and BDR role, these type of roles, it's more about how people hire for it. It's really about the person rather than your experience because it, that's where the bottom of it starts, right? Like that's where you start. You have a career in tech sales, it starts from STR, BDR. And to be in order to be successful when you apply for these roles, they really want to know if you have that competitive mentality. Like, what did you do in university or, like, outside of your work that shows that competitiveness, that shows that you won't give up? Like, what, if you was you were a student athlete, great, say that. If you were, like, let's say you built something, say that. If you had good grades, that's also good because it shows that you worked hard and mm-hmm. you have the work ethic. But yeah. grades only go so far, right? I For think sure. the, the extracurriculars, if you're in university, speak volumes. So, like... When I talked about how Vahid and I met in the elevator, uh, we became really great friends. And then maybe like three, four months down the line, I was looking for a new opportunity. You referred me to my my previous job, which I'm no longer there. Um, But I remember at the time you were helping me go through interviews and we were talking about some of my experience. And I used to be a competitive dancer. And you told me, really focus on that, hone in on that. If anybody was a competitive athlete, like they were on a sports team. That's right. the, The drive and especially if you're on a team sport, I think that speaks volumes because sales is a team sport. Even though you're individually driving, you've got your own targets and meetings that you need to book, you've got an overarching team goal that you're contributing to. For sure. I mean, that's 100% true. Again, when I say grades, like grades could be one one of the factors. If you have good yeah. grades, show them off. If you don't have good grades, that's okay too. Like just like pick something else. But you got to be competitive. Yeah. Like you can't just go into sales and not be competitive. And if if that's not you then like i would not recommend doing it what about if you're an introvert would you recommend going 100 percent uh being competitive and being introverted are not mutually exclusive um i think some of the best salespeople i've ever met there have been introverts and there's a good reason for that um, i'm extroverted by nature oh really but I'm, i couldn't <laughs> I mean, yeah. no. but 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 i try to uh really uh bring myself down more calm and kind of mimic the introverted behavior at times when I am in sales calls. There is a reason for that because introverted people don't speak a lot. They, they listen more Mm -hmm. and uh, listening in sales, active listening in sales is, is the key to success. Like uh, it's a key to empathy. Uh, People want to be heard. People want to be understood. Uh, It's a key to, uh, you being able to really, if you have a solution and you're on a sales call, how are you going to make sure you position the solution to their pain particularly, right? It's not always business pain, right? The people think it's always business pain. Business pain is one part of it. Sometimes it's that by selling the software to this person, it makes their life day to day easier. They had to work that extra hour. They don't have to anymore because it got automated. Great. Right. So it's not really a business that like that person that making a decision. I mean, why would they care? Like if that's going to be, a, but for them, like if like, sure, like every level of a company, it's really interesting when you think about selling a deal in SaaS, like who would really care about the overall well-being of a company? Right. The CEO. The CEO, maybe, maybe the executive team. Yeah. Right. And why would they care about it? Because. A lot of time, their compensation is actually tied to the performance of the company. As a mid-level manager, the VP levels, you don't really care if the company, like, if this is gonna like revolutionize the company, right? Yeah, especially like with how long people stay at companies nowadays, right? Even mid-level managers move around every couple years, three years, exactly. right? You have to think about what they care about, right? Do they care about the over? Like, you can go pitch somebody and say, "Oh, this is gonna revolutionize your business as a whole." They're like, "Okay, like." cool like what is that going to do for me exactly mm-hmm. right a lot of people are the, 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 there's a level of self-interest in the corporate world as in that you have to really realize what is that self-interest how does this solution that you're bringing to them it's going to help them 
to get to that self-interest. It's going to be aligned with that self-interest. Also, it could have a good business case for them. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's a bit of a mix. Point. Yeah. Okay. So we talked a little bit about what makes a salesperson successful, what kind of things to look for, like active listening, really leading with empathy, the fact that an introvert can be a good salesperson. Absolutely. And one thing that I do want to touch on a little bit is I want to explore opportunities within tech itself. So we talked about sales, BDR route, going in, becoming an account executive moving on to enterprise level. But if somebody doesn't necessarily have that competitive drive that we talked about, what are some of the other opportunities within tech, within the sales organization, or perhaps just within tech itself sure. that people can explore? Well, uh, being competitive is something that you could kind of, so it could be a skill that could be built, but you really need to, it's You kind very, of have it or you don't, you know? It's kind of internal, right? So it's hard to teach it. It's like cooking, you know? You can get a recipe. Like, the, my mom's a great cook. Oh, she definitely is. And she can give me a recipe, but there's no way I can make it the same. It's the same recipe. I mean, Vahid, you've definitely tried to make Persian chicken quite a few times based yeah. on your mom's recipe. And let me tell you, it does not turn out the same. No, it's just not the same. Is That's right. So it's like that. So you can't really teach it. It's kind of like you have to kind of feel it a yeah. little bit. But there's other parts of, I mean, if you don't want to, and some people don't like sales and that's okay. Like it's not, it's not for everyone. It's a tough job. It's a really tough job. Uh, your compensation is most of it is based. It's variable. Uh, you have a base salary and then you have commission or bonuses. Right. And so that's really variable. So if you, let's say if you have a good year and then you make a lot of money and your lifestyle changes, then you better damn make sure you work hard enough for that to come back because it's hard to like, but your most of your compensation is variable and is tied to your performance. You can't really have a lot of bad, like, you can have a bad week, but you can have bad months. You can't, it can't be it because then you won't perform. And if you don't perform, the reality is after a while, companies get rid of sales pool really quickly, right? And so it's a very, uh, in terms of job security, it's probably one of the lowest ones. Right. So, but there's a risk associated with going to sales. It's a risky role. It's, it's, You're selling this so well. Low job security. Well, it is. Incredibly but, variable but pay. there's a big but. Uh, the big but is that you get compensated for it if you're good at it. And what does that compensation look like for somebody that's at an account level, an account executive role? They're in six figures. Now, I don't think there's any sales job nowadays. Even BDRs are making six figures, which is crazy. But even account executives level in SaaS companies, I don't think there is any job that pays less than six figure. Then if they are, it's, it's just a crappy company. You shouldn't go there. So it's very much high risk, high reward. Exactly. And it's a type of money that if you're early in your career and if you're young, making six figures is really good. It's fantastic. Well, show me any other career where you can come out of school within two to three years start earning six figures yeah I mean, I mean there are some careers but it's called investment banking which you have to work 90 hours weeks yeah well i mean actually hourly rate they're probably making less than someone in sales well, same they with work until 2 a.m yeah same with accountants like i mean there's some jobs but sales is one thing that and also getting into management consulting you have to have like a perfect gpa you need to have all these things whereas in sales not that's not necessarily true you don't have to have those things to be able to earn that kind of money. You just have to have grit, right? Based on what you're talking about with exactly. the job being as difficult as it is. And it's repetitive. Like Vahid and I have worked together for maybe almost four years. Yeah. So it's definitely a repetitive job. But when you become good at it, yeah, it becomes easier, I would say. Yeah, it becomes easier. And also like you get the problem with so you can also get really complacent in sales that that's another downfall is that you need to really stay up to date like with the new information the way people are buying you know you need to really edu keep educating yourself whether it's through like articles or just like books whether through videos and just following people on linkedin that are like thought leaders in the space uh just really understand like how because people think about it yourself like how you bought stuff 10 years ago and today it's drastically different. I would say even how you buy, buy bought stuff like five years ago till today is drastically different. Yeah, now I got an ad on Instagram for a pair of 
sports check sneakers. Exactly. They're thirty dollars, and I'm like, yeah, let's go. I need these. I didn't even know I needed them. Sports check new. Anyways, bought those shoes, and they're the best thirty dollars that I spent on shoes. So. Sometimes Target ads are great, but yes, definitely the way that people buy as a consumer, I've noticed a radical shift in how I buy. Now imagine that for like a huge corporation right. and a massive investment, like a piece of software that's going to change some of their internal processes. Yeah, and a lot of times the software is funny because it's technology. Um, like you said, you need like how you said that you didn't know you needed this. A lot of times, sports check new. Yeah, like a lot of times that that's the case, right? You go to a company. And say, hey, look, look, we can do this better by this. So the company didn't know they needed something like this, right? Now, that being said, they obviously didn't have a budget for it either. Because you don't have a budget for something that you never knew you are going to have, yeah. right? So that's the challenge a lot of times is that how are we going to go in? First of all, show them we can do it better. Second of all, now they have to pay us money. And third of all, there's usually no trials. You have to pay till you see the results. <laughs> I think know? this is applicable to not just sales, but anybody that's going into a meeting where they're pitching executives yeah. and they want to drive their decision or they want to drive a certain outcome. So yeah. what would you say the biggest piece of advice is for anybody, not necessarily someone even in sales, but you're walking into an executive meeting. How do you drive the outcome that you're looking to achieve? So again, come back to understanding what they want and how your solution is going to solve that problem. That's the most important thing. Um, I had a sales manager that one gave me the one of the best advices and one of the best thing you can say on every sales call meeting that truly just unravels people who are talkative and also people who are really cold and give you one word answers. And that's a question you can ask. You can give them an agenda on everything else that you do, the, the, the classics. But one question you can always ask at the beginning of any meeting is that what would make this call or this meeting a successful meeting for you? That's a good one. Another way to say it is why did you show up to this meeting? Right? So when you book a meeting with someone, especially someone you don't know, there's a reason you showed up. It means their pitch was some part of it was interesting to you. Right, you thought this might solve your some problem that you might have, so you showed up for a reason. A lot of times, what the mis- the mistake that a lot of salespeople make is that they go into a meeting, they set an agenda, the person on the other hand just kind of quiet, right? And you just kind of blurb stuff and you say all your products and stuff, and at the end of it, they're like, "Okay, thank you." They never get back to you. Why? Because they probably weren't there for the things you said to them. If you just ask them that simple question, now what would make this call a successful call for you? And that'll like, it, it's never failed me. They just, I've used it as well. You yeah. you gave me that advice. I've used it, and it's been it's worked for me personally. It's great. It just like people because somebody if somebody asked me that kind of question, I've been on like I've been trying to be sold on the other side of it. Yeah. And if somebody asked me that question, I'll tell them exactly why I showed up. Because I don't take a call or. Nobody takes a call for no reason. Spending half an hour of your day, like working day on someone they don't know. Like everybody has busy schedule. So there's a reason they show. So let's just figure out what that is. It could be an executive even, right? So even if you're an executive, if you showed up to a call, there's a good reason for that. And they'll exactly tell you why they, sh- why they showed up. And the rest of it is easy. Because when they tell you why they showed up, the rest of the call, it is the art that... Whatever solution that you have, align it with what they told you right at the beginning of the call. Tie it back into that. Tie it back into that. Tell them why this will solve the solve that problem that they told you at the beginning. So you called sales an art. Yeah. I think sales is more of a science and an art. It's a bit of both. What would you say? It's a bit of a both. Like I have seen probably sales is also one of those things that it comes to some people a lot easier and nicer and faster and there's like a i've seen like just natural salespeople. Mm-hmm. they just have so much conviction they just have so much drive they really have a presence they have charisma yeah you want to buy from them exactly and there are some people that i've seen that are absolutely opposite of that but they worked on it and they're one of 
best damn salespeople I've ever met. What's that key? They just like, they were consistent. They mimic what was working. Like we don't need to, that's I think it's a bad idea that we, everybody kind of talks about this. You don't need to try everything yourself. You don't need to fail at everything yourself. I think that's just like a pretty dumb thing. Like if there are 10 things that for sure are going to kill a sales call and because there's so many people we can learn from around you usually, they've done it and they failed over and over. You shouldn't make the same mistake. That's just absolutely ridiculous. You should just learn from the people and the mistakes that they made. Go learn from the people who are successful at the same job. If you're in a job and somebody's doing better than you, go ask them what they're doing. Sit on a couple of calls. Tell them to come sit on a couple of your calls, right? Because there is, we shouldn't fail at things that are already been proven you're going to fail at. You know what I mean? Like, let's say if you, the I, mistakes. I get what you're saying, but like, let's say with sales, yeah. you're starting out. You're a BDR. You're picking up the phone and you're calling day in and day out. Yeah. It's easy to say you shouldn't fail at things that you shouldn't fail at because somebody else has already failed. And I completely agree. I think learning from other people's failures is the only shortcut we have to success. Yeah. But at the end of the day, there are certain failures that you need to do yourself in order to learn how to become better. You need to be yeah. rejected 10 times in order to get up. And, and go for, for sure. the 11th call. Well, the thing about failure isn't that like you're not going to get rejected, you're not going to fail. It's like the mistakes that you shouldn't make like over and over. Like if somebody tells you, okay, don't do this on a call or don't like let them talk or take pauses, you keep not doing that. Like that's not – if somebody tells you that, you should just do it. You, sh you shouldn't make mistakes that are common mistakes. You know what I mean? That are and over and over. It's okay to do it once, yeah. do it twice, but then like, if you're gonna keep making mistakes, the easiest way to become successful in sales or pretty much anything is to kind of learn and absorb the information that's already been out there and it's proven to work, and avoid the things that are proven to not work. And sales is very much of a recipe in a sense that you can. Like, you can get really good at it. Yeah, you just need to add more sauce. Yeah, it's more sauce. Yeah, that's when, right. when I was interviewing for my first sales job, he was helping me and, and kind of, like, walking me through that process. And the biggest piece of feedback he gave me was, Nicole, you got to add more sauce. That's right. Um, you can never have more sauce. You can never have too much sauce. Because you're going to get lost in the sauce, Anthony Bourdain. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of times, like, if you really want to be successful in sales, if you're young, you're trying to get into it, uh, really show that, go go for SDR or BDR role at a good software company. Show them why you're the best. It's never been a better time to really apply for these type of jobs. There's a ton of them out there. Nowadays, like really hard to find people. And a lot of companies are now moving towards a less higher base on personality, mainly rather than your experience. Mm -hmm. And that's where you can shine. And just keep learning. You have to go sit on other people's calls. You have to have the embarrassment of blowing up a call and just getting other people to listen to it until they give you feedback. It really sucks. Think speaking about that, do you have an example of like your worst sales call? Oh yeah. Like I went to a sales call once with my manager that we just talked to them and again I was kinda it was earlier in my career, just kinda Talk to them, talk to them, like 15 minutes in, and we just realized we we're talking to a completely a wrong company. It's just, it's not the company that we thought they will be. Oh we showed God. up, we're like, I'm like, look at my manager, I'm like, shit, this is not the company at all. Like, these are not, they're like, this is not it. Like, we're talking to a completely a <laughs> wrong company. That's so never happened to me, that's hilarious. Oh, it was brutal. It was, it was pretty bad, and it was like embarrassing because we're up there like, we're not this company. And we're like, Oh yeah, sorry. We just made a mistake, and we just kind of win with it. Yeah. But yeah, that was that was pretty bad. There's like a lot. Like I probably like blew more sales calls than actually successful ones because, like, you gotta blow a lot of sales calls, and that's okay. Like, it's good. Like, it's good to blow sales calls because it it kind of gives you that confidence the next time. Just in sales, also you have to really, really, really stay relaxed. Um. Yeah, because people smell insecurity. Yeah. you got to speak with conviction. That's it's, the big thing. Smell desperation, too. If yeah. end of the quarter, you're not hitting. You're like, damn, like, i got to push this. Like, if I can't push yeah. this, like, maybe I can 
do this, you can't be desperate because if you, they smell desperation, um, yeah, you need to be really, you, they could call this thing out of five. Like one of my managers told me, like means that like really you have to like, you can't get too excited when you're having a good, like good month or a good quarter or a good year. And you can't get really too upset and get down on yourself that you get like, you just kind of stop doing it. Right. So you have to stay in the middle, stay relaxed and stay consistent. Yeah, that's a big thing with sales. It's definitely all about consistency because it benefits you at the end of the day, right? We talked about sales being so volatile in terms of what your your pay looks like because it's commission and bonus based. If you're having a really good quarter, you're making a lot of money. And then your quota is always usually based off of what you delivered in the past because the company will see that well if you brought in this much and you over delivered 130 percent on what we asked you to do well we're just going to raise your targets yeah the targets never go down the targets are always going to go up and that makes sense because companies want to make more money and more they want to grow yeah right not and necessarily a lot of good things that hire salespeople too are in their growth stage right they're tech companies whether they're startups or more established, they're trying to grow its remain. That's your core function yeah. as a salesperson. You're driving growth for the business. I mean, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's like, let's say if you had a business, what would you want your salespeople to do? You want them to sell more. Of course. You want to grow your company. You're never going to be like, oh, it's okay. Just let's stay. At, you know what I mean? You yeah. don't want to do that. It's okay, honey. You yeah, can... you can't just stay. <laughs> no, they always want to grow. And that yeah. makes sense. Um, but there's a lot of positives to sales. Right. Um, What's your favorite thing about sales? The money. Right. Yeah. The money's great in sales. Like, like if you really uh, like work hard and you really get into it and you kind of really figure it out, you can't earn a lot of money earlier in your in your tw- in your twenties, which is very important because having good amount of money, making six figures in your twenties, it really gets you ahead in life. In what way? In a lot of ways. Like, I mean, you you can have like. You can purchase like assets like you know much earlier like we all know that if you purchase asset earlier like it's much better even like five years ten years earlier than your peers you'd be much more ahead in life right whether you, that would be a property whether that would be I mean stocks or anything really if you have that disposable income that you can actually build things uh, whether it's an asset let us let's say you want to build a side hustle Side hustles, like, side hustles are not free. Like, it's just, you need money. Yeah. You need some money, at least, to start something. And that sum, I think most businesses nowadays, minimum, we need five, ten grand to start something. Mm-hmm. To try it. And you should be... Depends. If it's a digital product-based business, you just need time. Yeah, that too. But then you got to promote it. You got to, like, really, like, I, th- okay. I think really yeah. you need money, like, to start. And, like, you need to also be okay with that money being fully gone. Yeah. Like, you can't be, like, attached to it. And let's say if you're making 60 grand a year or like 50 grand a year, five grand is 10% of your salary. Actually, well, after tax, you take home probably like 35, 40. So like that's over 12%, 13% of your salary. You didn't say goodbye to it. Yeah. That could be one month. When I started my first e-commerce business, the self-tanning kit, which I've talked to my audience a little bit about, that was when I was working at a very big telecom company straight out of school. I was making like my salary 60,000 all in. Yeah. So it's difficult. I spent five grand. I had to save up. Spent five grand on a product. Complete failure. Yeah. It's hard. It's right? hard. Like you said, that was a major chunk yeah. of my salary. So you definitely see what you what you're saying. Yeah. I agree with you 100. Yeah. percent And now imagine I have to double that, your salary. All of a all of a sudden you have access to double the money, right? And that's a lot more money that you can do things with. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a huge believer. Penny pinching won't won't help you get rich or wealthy but you need to have some rules for yourself what are those well the thing is like if you're getting money there's a certain percentage of your money that you put towards like building wealth and you should enjoy your money too because we're all gonna die Mm -hmm. that's for sure you guys don't know this but vahid loves shoes he's an avid shoe collector yeah so i love shoes uh, I don't buy a lot of shoes anymore, but I, I haven't done a spree for like a couple of years. I still love shoes, but I, I have too many of them now, so I, and I take care of them, so you don't really need new ones. So yeah. like when you have like forty pairs, so you just you have forty pairs of shoes. I had I, forty. You know I probably have forty. Pairs of shoes. I had forty pairs of like really nice shoes. And I donated like half of it probably because I wasn't wearing them. 
Yeah, remember when you accidentally donated half your summer clothes by bagging yeah. them up? <laughs> yeah, that's okay though. Honestly, like I don't know. With Things clo- happen. Yeah, with clothing, I, every six months I donate a bunch because like if you're not wearing something for a year, you shouldn't keep it. Like yeah. if you didn't wear it, what do you think you're gonna wear it in two years? Maybe probably, probably not. Right. Okay, so living below your means. Yeah, living below your means. Enjoy the money. Like it's it's good to like enjoy it and like treat yourself a little bit. Like, but don't go overboard with like stupid things like because let's say like you make let's say you make like 10 grand a month let's say you got into a good sales job made 120 k it's great after tax taking home probably i don't know like 80k of it maybe right and that's like seven grand a month around there right so you make seven grand a month after tax which is a that's shitload a lot, of money yeah. a lot of money and so now you have seven grand a month so i would say okay like let's say you pay rent so you have rent out of seven grand, you pay like what, 1500 bucks in rent? Up. Well, show me where you're going to get a $1,500. Let's say two grand for one person. You can get a two grand per. Yeah. For one, one bedroom, you can definitely get it in Toronto. That's five. You have five grand, right? Left. Out of five grand, you probably have phone bills. Bills. You have bills. Right? You have to pay your bills. So 300 bucks, two, 300 bucks for all your bills, right? So now you have what? You have like 4,700 bucks. Let's say you want to eat. Because you have to eat. <laughs> okay, so let's say another thousand goes to food. Yeah, a thousand goes to food. You say you want to go out a little bit too, right? And have fun. It's not a 500 bucks at least nowadays. More than that, if anything. You, you go out one night in Toronto. It's 100 bucks. Yeah. Pretty much. Let's say you go out four or five nights a week, five, six, seven, So you end up with like, you get two, three grand to actually save up. And that's really good. That's a lot, that's a lot of, of money. That's a lot of money, right? So, but just make sure you have that limit, right? So you're just saying, okay, like, I'm going to have like, that two, three grand, I'm going to put it away. I'm going to do something with it, right? I'm going to, okay, like, I'm going to save this money or, like, I'm going to buy stocks with it or I'm going to, like, do something with it. Don't leave it in your savings because, like, the nice part about making good money in your 20s is also you can, if you lose it all, it's okay. Like, you can always you know, you more. can always make more, right? So it's like you have time, right? The time is not, there's no time decay. Like, it's not against you. If you lose a couple grand, in your, in your 20s, it's not much, right? You know, you'll you earn it back. Back. And you don't have a lot of responsibilities yet, right? So you're not married, likely. You don't have kids. You're not, like, I don't know, you're not tied down to, like, a 30-year, like, $2 million mortgage. You know, it, it's, like, there's a lot of flexibility in your life, yeah, right? So, like, sure. and that's that's nice. So you can take more risks with that money. I see a lot of people that start off, their career in sales start earning this this money right they start earning six figures for the first time maybe they're the first person in their family to ever earn that kind of money yeah and they go overboard real quick they start buying designer shit that adds up so fast right yeah they get addicted get wrong. to it and like it's great to treat yourself but i think it's there's always a balance and there's always like a fine line between when you're treating yourself too much yeah. and you're just enjoying yourself right it's also relative right i have a bunch of designer stuff don't get me wrong like i don't say don't buy anything for yourself i, I love to treat yeah. myself too but it's like within reason within reason yeah it's, it's everything within reason is in that okay like what am what am i like first is like how much i'm putting away yeah. for the future and then after it's a trickle down right let's say okay if i'm if i make x amount I want to put like 30, 40%. If I can put 30% away, that's like amazing. I have 40% away. That's amazing. Right? That's huge. If you can, if you can do that. 40% of your income. And in sales, that's you can insane. sometimes. Yeah. In sales, yeah. you can if you're smart and like you're, and you still can enjoy yourself. Like, I mean, depending on where you are and what kind of sales job you have and like how good you are at your job, there, there are circumstances that you can't do that. But again, it does take a lot of, and you can't do it. It's not a job. It's the thing. It's hard. It's hard if you're the cash flows and coming in as much to build things, mm-hmm. right? If you make, I don't know, if you make low five figures, like 50 to like 70 grand, it's really difficult. First of all, you can't get a mortgage. Like nowadays with like Toronto like prices, you can 100%, buy nothing it's, really with it. It's like really it's tough. like you can buy stocks, you can buy other assets, but real estate initially is tougher to break out of the too. window, right? If you don't have help, it's out of the window. Yeah. It's like, average home a condo one bedroom. condos are definitely way more affordable and attainable for people but yeah even even but that it, will, it takes like not five even years roughly anymore, to, yeah yeah like if you're like, making like 50 grand it's going to take you five years to save up well, for a down payment i did the calculations not even you won't even qualify for a mortgage to make 50 grand enough to, to well, you do it with a partner 
yeah, if you do it with a partner, like you need to do a lot of things, right? If yeah. you're trying to do it on your own, it's like nowadays it's impossible, right? So yeah, that's it's, the uh, unfortunate it's, reality. Yeah, it's, it's tough. It's really tough. That's another good reason why you should go into sales because there is an opportunity for you that's not based on your not based on your really experience per se like you know sometimes somebody has 20 years of experience and that's really valuable and yeah. they pay them because of that in sales that's not always the, the definitely people who have 10 20 years of good sales experience in massive companies they make shitload of money some in seven figures even yeah like they're putting oracle salesforce and like tableau like tableau is part of salesforce now well, those but, are the enterprise sales guys like that but those are it's a different ball game yeah. the kind of thing like that's, those guys that's are perfecting making... your craft that's working yeah. your way and and building this art like that's why you know some artists get paid millions of dollars for their artwork yeah we talked about sales being a bit of an art as well it's not for sure and a lot of those guys are it's because the relationships that they have yeah. like if you are been in software sales like from early 2000s and then now the people who you sold from previous companies now they're in executive positions so they'll go where you go and that's valuable for companies right because this sales rep just brings money it attracts money for the company so they're going to pay them really handsomely but um going back to that the fact that you can make that kind of money early in your early 20s and it opens up doors for you right and like it's really hard to make six figures in your 20s if you're if you're doing like non-sales jobs it really hard it's really hard like any well, kind of outside of sales what are what are the other opportunities like we said management consulting finance maybe some banking. finance if you like dryness like finance is good like you really hate finance eh? i don't hate finance i think it's just like a bit more drier side of things it's not as exciting there's no like i mean if you're doing a merger and acquisition like if you're on an m&a deal that's of exciting. course, but you're not getting part of that M and A. Like you know what Fair. I mean. You're working like putting decks together. Yeah. Like all the analysts, associates, a lot of them, what they do is like, at, in big investment firms, like investment banking firms, they're putting like decks together for a year or two, putting like presentations together. Like yeah. that can. And be... they have to go to one of the top schools. They have yeah. to have the top. And grades. pulling all nighters like all the time. I have, I've had friends that are like burnt out and they couldn't do it. They had to go do get some jobs that are a little bit less like stressful because, and again. It's not worth it also to make that kind of money if you can't use it and you don't have the time, right? So, again, just know that we're going to die at the end. That's kind of morbid, but, you know, but it's you're true. right. Like, and let's say, like, if you don't, if you can't enjoy your 20s and 30s and 40s, like, it's really hard to enjoy yourself. Like, there's so many things you can't do when you're 70 and 80, even 60. Yeah. Just you don't have the energy. Like, you can't get on a jet ski and just rip the jet ski. You can't just, like do fun things as much as you can stay up till 2 a.m. Like if you want to go out and have fun, you just can't do those things. And sure, you might have money later, but if you can't have that money earlier, right, all of a sudden you could build your future and you can have the fun while you have the energy and you can enjoy the life that you want to have. Mm -hmm. But it, it's all comes down to your mindset, right? Like what kind of mindset you want to have. And it's not easy by any mean, but People get rewarded for the risks that they take. And whether it's in sales, whether it's entrepreneurs, whether it's like anyone, they're not like glamorous kind of things to do. They're hard. They take resilience. They take uh, a lot of consistency. And a lot of them, you don't see the results right away. But if you keep staying consistent and you put the consistent effort over and over and over, uh, they'll pay off. They, not, they may not pay off tomorrow. They will not pay off in a week, but they'll pay off eventually. And people who are people who are like consistent on their effort, I really think like it's better to put out 70% effort all the time than putting 100 for three months. I agree, but it's it's hard to be consistent. Yeah, but that that's why it's important. You shouldn't put 100 all the time. When you put 100, you'll just become when you put 100% effort, you'll you'll burn out. Mm -hmm. You're human. Like you, if you exhaust yourself all the time, every day, how long can you really do that? You can't, right? Yeah, it's not but if you put sixty percent every day all the time, you'll be had. What is that story of a Pareto principle, eighty twenty rule? That I don't know. There's not a one to. It's like a, a hair and a what is it? Is it the turtle and the hair? The or, turtle and the hair. Yeah, turtle and the hair. Like yeah. it's really that life is like. You could like, your consistent effort. You know, will get you there. 
and and I think that that's the key to success in sales. That's the key to success in being an entrepreneur. That's the key to success to moving up the ladder. Like whatever it's your thing is, like consistency is key to all of them. I definitely agree with you. Okay, Vahid, I have two final questions for you. One, what does money mean to you? Money just uh, means freedom. It really is. Um, it's very, very difficult. Like money definitely doesn't make you happy. That that's a hundred percent for sure. But it does buy you pleasure. I mean, it's a lot easier and it's a lot more enjoyable to cry in a yacht than it is <laughs> well, to cry in a shack. Well, no, like I I know a lot of people with money, like a lot of money, and I know a lot of them are unhappy. Like you could have the biggest house in, in the world, but it's if it's empty and nobody's there, it's kind of sad and lonely. But but money does buy you the freedom, right? Like you can do things that most people can't do when you have the earnings, right? Like you can have a better place. You can, you can bring like, you can buy a Peloton and be like in your bedroom. You can work out, you know, now you don't have to go to the gym, you know, you don't have, you know what I mean? So like yeah. those things are something that money will buy the freedom and the pleasure. Money doesn't make you happy, but it does buy you freedom and pleasure. And a lack of it will make you miserable, right? There's a certain level. Right. It's like thinking about, OK, how much money is a good amount of money? Right. So it's like, how much do you need? Like, do you really think like somebody like Jeff Bezos or these guys who are like billionaires do wake up every day and they think about their money? Probably they don't because, you no. know, you have, what what is that they can't do? I'll buy Look at anything they want. Right. So wasn't it Bezos who was building himself a new yacht and couldn't get it through the bridge into the I port? Think it was them, so yeah. he had to rebuild the whole bridge. Yeah. So, I mean, they have so much money that that's it's like they just want like the, to them values the value of the money is true freedom yeah of what how they want to the impact right and money does give you impact it's foolish to think money doesn't give you impact money to this day in north america actually anywhere in the world really money and influence go hand in hand i agree i think money gives you the opportunity to use it as a tool and create this world that you want to live in so that's my philosophy. I think money is. Yeah, money is a tool and you shouldn't be working for money. You know, like it's yeah. just like if you're always working to just earn all the time and working like okay, I want to make money, money should be, you should like focus on like what, what, that what is, what, to. yeah, what is it like, are you enjoying? Like it's, it's nice when you can align what you enjoy with like making money and just pick passions that are like humans don't have one passion. Most humans. Like there are some exceptional ones that they have like one hardcore passion, but most humans enjoy multiple things. Mm -hmm. Just pick the one that makes you money too. That's good feedback. That actually maybe answers my last question for you, which is if you have one piece of closing advice, yeah. what would you say? Um, if you're young and I mean, I'm still young, I'm going to be 30 this year. So if you're in your early twenties, depend no matter what you're doing, just stay consistent with your effort, whatever it is, right? It's okay to not know what you want to do. It's okay to try different things. Just stay consistent with that and don't give up on the search because it'll come around and it'll click one day. And when I say one day, I'm not talking about 20 years from now. It'll be like a couple of years and it'll click what you want to do, right? Just stay with that and, and pick, pick, pick passions that are profitable. I think that that one probably comes from the fact that you almost pursued a degree in photography, photography right? Yeah. Like I almost I even like went to, did my portfolio for Ryerson, which is one of the best photography program in North America, in Canada at least. But I didn't go through with it, right? Like I was really good at math and I really enjoyed math. So like I, it's like people have multifacets. Every human has enjoy a few things, right? They don't enjoy just one thing unless you're like musician. Like, you know what I mean? Things that are like very deep rooted like you know what i want to do this well what's the difference between a musician and a photographer it's both a form of art yeah but like art usually doesn't pay that well right like it's well it's, neither does music if you're yeah it doesn't like art in general like if you're an artist if you're an athlete like i think your chance of becoming really wealthy is pretty low through being an athlete or music or art and i think if you don't make it by a certain age, you should give up on that and go do something else because you won't make it. You just won't. Like if you're an athlete, you can't be a 30-year-old baseball star. 
Maybe he does not contradict your initial advice of stay consistent. Well, stay consistent, pushing. but what, like, what if you're but, pushing towards the wrong thing. How do but, you know? Well, that's the thing. Like, you'll figure it out. One, like, it, it's also very important to know when to quit, as much as it's important when to keep going. Like, knowing when to quit is like huge, right? But 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 for athleticism, signs are pretty obvious. If you're 28, you're likely not gonna become the number one tennis player in the world because you just don't have the body of 18 year old. It just won't work. It, like it just doesn't happen. Yeah. Right. If you're in music, like if you're not doing things that you can get into a mainstream of things and you can like don't do a good job of marketing, you're not going to make it. You're just like, no, no matter how much you like, there was a, I think it was a, I don't know, it was a, a who's the artist? I think it was like T-Pain or something. It's like every song that comes out, you got to spend minimum 200K. I spent 200K on my own money to promote it. And T-Pain has a big name. Yeah. It's not like somebody you don't know. 200, 200K minimum per song. If you want to get it big. So okay, so that speaks volumes. I also like you know I just like shooting the shit with you. And yeah, yeah, of course. Like, yeah, he's one of my best friends. So uh, when I'm just I'm just trying to poke his buttons. Yeah, it's my favorite thing to yeah. do. Yeah, but that's that's true. I mean, there's there are things that you need to do, but it's also as important to know when to give up. Yeah, there's a great book that I actually read. It's called The Dip by Seth Godin about people that start businesses, and there's three different curves. I'll do a whole episode on this: knowing when to quit and knowing how to take the right risks because that's invaluable like you can spend so long working on a business and this is called the cul-de-sac where at one point you just drop yeah you can work on a sinking ship for a long time yeah. before it's fully sunk it's like you watch those people on dragon's den and sometimes i'm like how how did you invest a million dollars of your own hard-earned money into yeah. this idea like did you not see what this was you know yeah, it's wild some of the stuff that you see but yeah it's, it's, it's but hey, they're too. pursuing their passion yeah, but I'm just saying, like, you don't have one passion, right? Just pick the right one. Yeah. Try to pick the right one. Or if that one doesn't work, just go to the next one. Keep doing it because you got to keep trying different things. Leave no stone unturned, as Alex exactly. says. Exactly. Because eventually, like, it's hard to... And then you'll figure out one thing that you can go all in. Yeah. But you, you definitely likely won't be your first five to ten things. You know? That's good advice. There was a lot in this episode. I appreciate you being here, Vahid. I appreciate you. you sharing your wisdom. I think it was a great conversation. And uh, yeah, if you guys like this kind of content, let me know if you want to see more of it. Let me know what you want to see on this channel. I took some time off to reflect and really think about what kind of value I'm bringing to you guys. And I want to make sure that you're enjoying this content to the fullest. So if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button and um, stay tuned for, for more content and launching new episodes every Wednesday. Thanks for listening, guys. Take care. Thanks.